Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Sarah said, I run the international trade practice at Russell McVeigh. And as a firm, we're really delighted to be one of your gold sponsors of this really interesting conference this year. And personally, as an international trade lawyer and a very keen follower of um, all things Brexit, I'm really excited to be able to introduce our next speaker to you. Uh, if you follow UK politics closely, you'll know Boris Johnson was appointed as UK Prime Minister last week, and there are 40 parliamentary days until uh, the UK is scheduled to leave the EU on the 31st of October. And if you're looking at the, um, what the bookies are saying now in the UK, the odds are on that we'll have a no-deal Brexit now before the end of the year. And that's going to have some really serious implications, including for the red meat industry. I think the government and industry have done a lot to ensure regulatory continuity, but I think there's still a lot more to be done in order to ensure commercial continuity. And commercial risk management is going to be really important. So with that background, I think we're really lucky to have a red meat industry representative on the ground in London advocating for New Zealand, trying to ensure we keep uh, continued access to the UK and EU market post-Brexit, and also that that access is improved um, if we're able to negotiate an FTA with the UK in the years ahead. And I think Jeff Grant is um, expertly placed to be that representative. Jeff's had a 35-year career in farming, in politics and in business. He still runs three farms. He has uh, a property business, a tourism business, uh, and also has shares in a vet operation. He's had seven years in Parliament as an MP and as Senior Whip for National Government. And he's also um, had a 25-year career in governance, sitting on the boards of 24 companies and as Chairman of 10. So he's eminently well qualified to represent us on the ground in London. And with that introduction, I hope you'll join me in welcoming Jeff Grant to the stage. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, firstly, uh, for the uh, kind words. Uh, can I just say, uh, this is a slightly different temperature to the one I've experienced in London. I think I left London on Friday, and it was uh, 34 degrees. The day before, it was 38. For many of you will know, London's not designed for the heat. Uh, they do exceptionally well on keeping you warm in the winter time. Uh, they have no bloody idea what to do on a hot day. They lock themselves into buildings that are ill air conditioned, especially New Zealand House. Uh, it, it cools on one side and heats on the other in terms of the current air conditioning system. But it is interesting that uh, in terms of the climate uh, by temperature, it is probably one of those things that has reflected uh, the attitudes over the last uh, three years as the UK tries to find its way out of what can only be called a bugger's muddle. I'm going to go through a range of topics with you, just briefly about the position itself, and then uh, just how did they get there, terms I call it Brexit 101, a little bit around the f uh, what is in front of them. And can I just say that I did these slides on Thursday uh, and uh, UK time, and by Friday they were wrong. Uh, and I have learnt, I usually do an email on Sunday night UK time, uh, so that everybody in the industry back here gets it on Monday morning. I usually find by eight o'clock on Monday morning in the UK, it is also wrong. The lovely thing about Brexit is that you can predict anything in terms of what the model might look like going forward, and you've got about a 50% chance of being right. There are no experts on this because it has changed every day and every week. You have been lucky uh, because in London you get this 24-7. Every morning, Sky, BBC, social media and the newspapers just go rabbiting on about Brexit. And they do sort of worry about what the rest of the world might be thinking. But the reality is, I think that uh, most people just can't quite work out how they got there and where they may go. So in terms of the position, uh, I was appointed just over uh, 16, 15 months ago. Uh, it was on the basis of the combined efforts of the industry to look at what was, uh, in their view, uh, a need to position around both Brexit and the future FTAs. 
So look, the role involves me keeping a, 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 a monitoring role in terms of the WTO split, and that's currently in Geneva, and I'll explain a little bit more at the end of the presentation around that. The Brexit process and its implications as it ran up to the 31st of March, and that's whether you could actually physically get stuff through the border, whether it's at Heathrow for chilled shipping uh, by aircraft or splitting containers, all those sort of things. And then in terms of the next steps, uh, I'll explain a bit later on about uh, both the European Union in terms of the 28 and the, 20, uh, the UK in terms of the free trade agreement. And the appointment I just want to acknowledge is a, a combination, as I said before, in terms of the industry with the MIA Beef and Lamb uh, New Zealand Meat Board and also some funding from Agmart. And because I'm learning in the UK, you have to be absolutely transparent about everything you do uh, and consult. I just need to notify you that I was the chairman of Agmart at one stage uh, for a period, but at that time, obviously I didn't realise I was going to be doing this job. But I just in case somebody in the media makes a connection about the funding and everything, that's uh, the basis of where it came from, a joint uh, project by the industry. I just also want to acknowledge I've been lucky enough to uh, establish a New Zealand house uh, and the High Commission has been fantastic in terms of MFAT. I have a really good relationship with the MPI through Chris Kewell, who is the Agriculture Councillor there, and also Customs. And so on the basis of that, uh, we can effectively get quite a good cross-section of what's happening in terms of the industry and in terms of what they are proposing uh, in regard to Brexit. So I found that uh, combination really good. And I'm now just trying to work out how this works. Right, oh, so how do we get there? So you all remember in 1973, finally after a period of time, the European uh, Union took in the UK as a, its member. And I have to say, they've debated as to whether that is the most appropriate way they should go going forward. And it's ironic, um, there is just two vision, divisions within the UK. There are the Eurosceptics and the Europhiles. So you're either one or the other. It's a bit like a Remainer and a Brexiteer. Don't ask the family which side they're on because they'll be one of each within the family. And one of the things I first learned when I was up there, don't publicly ask somebody how they voted. It's quite a personal thing and you shouldn't get involved. And so in that sense, you have to be careful. It's interesting, when they took that vote, you know, because there's this argument that a lot of people didn't understand what they voted for. I think that's an insult to the human brain. Uh, they had a rough idea. They wanted to know whether they were in or out. 72% of the population voted. So. In, term, in the context of a referendum, that was quite a high percentage. And this fascinating thing, 52% for leaving and 48% to remain. If you look at London at 8.5 million or 9 million people, 60% uh, of them voted to remain. And if you look at parts uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland, while not significant by number, uh, in terms of population, 1.8 and just on 5 million in Scotland, uh, again, at around 60, 40 in terms of remaining rather than leaving. But it was the east side and up into the northern regions where the big vote was, uh, and predominantly Labour held seats uh, for their ability to remove themselves from the, the European Union. Interesting, of the 650 MPs, and this will explain a little bit of why the problem is, uh, are Remainers. By virtue, our Remainers have been, and so on that basis, not overly enthusiastic about removing themselves. Current polling would show that if you took the people that have died since uh, June 2016, and the people who were 16, 15 and a half, 16, who are now 18, and voted, it would turn roughly about the other way because most of the older people wanted to get out and most of the younger people wanted to remain. But it's interesting, most people are hardline on where they voted. There is not a lot of change. In fact, the biggest change would be people just want to get on with it. So if you look at uh, why have they got themselves in this problem? Well, firstly, nobody expected the vote to be the way it was, except that I suppose if you're on the bus campaign as part of the Brexiteers, etc. But Generally, the polling and everybody sort of said, well, it, it'll be close, but... And so there was an argument 
that a lot of people didn't vote. But if it's 72% voting, I think there was a pretty good fair reflection of the community. And so there was no strategy or contingency of what to do once that vote took place. And so while David Cameron, as the Prime Minister, had tried for three years to get the European Union to understand that if it didn't change, that there would be consequences, I don't think anybody expected on the day for the referendum to turn out the way it was. Why, oh why, the Prime Minister of the day then chose to move on uh, exit by Article 50, so that was to trigger the process uh, through the Westminster parliamentary system without even then at that stage understanding what were the implications in terms of a lot of those views uh, is something that I still find quite difficult to work out. And the important part is she's operating, she was operating within a minority government and was relying on the DUP, uh, which is made up of 10 MPs from Northern Ireland. So if you wanted to get a sense of what are the implications in terms of the post the vote, uh, without any, so the cabinet was split all the way through. And uh, as I note there, since the beginning of 2017, this is the, uh, just prior to the checkers plan, uh, she has lost 35, well, she lost 35 cabinet ministers, 25 of them over Brexit. So they either said something or disagreed uh, and then uh, got out of cabinet. I see I've said uh, their third minister, we're actually on the fourth minister, uh, Baker, Baker just turned down Boris Johnson to be the uh, Brexit minister. He said, I don't want to be a junior minister again and have no control. Uh, so we're actually on to the fourth one. And then uh, in terms of the 19 of the last, uh, in the last 18 months, 19 of the cabinet ministers out of 29 had new portfolios. So that interchange within the cabinet and that interchange across government departments can explain for some of the confusion uh, that you would get in terms of where they were deciding to go. But the big turning point came in July 2018 was the Chequers deal. Again, this, this seemed to be extraordinary to me from understanding New Zealand political system where the Prime Minister and 10 Downing Street thought they had a deal. That is correct, she had a deal with the European Commission and the European Union, but she didn't have a deal with her own party and with her own Westminster system. So on the basis of this, we started to get all of this stuff coming out. If you want, I'd never heard of mutual recognition in terms of what, what it meant for Brexit. That was the first one. Then, a com then this came out the common rule book. Nobody could see that working. I don't know where that came from. Managed divergence. Uh, this was the start of the sort of conversation about how you're going to do with the, deal with the bits that weren't going to quite work in the first round. That would be all part of the transition. Temporary customs arrangement. And the one that uh, fascinates me the most, the Irish backstop. If you go back to look at the media coverage back in 2016, other than one or two commentary people, nobody talked about the Irish backstop. And this has become the fundamental issue. If you're not too sure what it is, just Google Good Friday Agreement and work your way back from there. Understanding the politics of this is fundamental in terms of understanding the outcome of Brexit, in my view. It is a square peg into a round hole. It is impossible, in my view, although there will be some in the current regime who will say there will be mechanisms in terms of future arrangements on the border. But simply this means you have a border which you go backwards and forwards across. There are 320 crossings between Northern Ireland and Ireland and you physically don't get stopped in any shape or form. That is the fundamental thing for the Good Friday Agreement that both on both sides of the border, nobody wants to put the border back up. In fact, in my most recent visit there, I was fascinated. I've been in Belfast 20 years ago. If anybody had been in Belfast, you'll remember to go to a shopping centre down on the main street uh, you would have to go through two checkouts as you went in by security to get into the department store and two to come back out again. And to go back there 20 years later and see no border, in fact I made this mistake in the rental car, I was driving up the road trying to see where the border was on my way to Belfast and uh, I got across the line, which I assume by the GPS was probably roughly where the border was and it said 60 
and I was driving along and these people were just flying past me on the motorway. I had gone from 100k to 60k because I thought that's what the 60 meant. And I thought these bloody Irish they just don't take any concern around their laws. And then realised about three kilometres later I'd crossed the border and it was actually 60 miles an hour uh, because we were back in the UK. So that's the significance of not even being able to tell where the border is. And so the thought of just pushing this through uh, is a real worry uh, in terms of their outcome. And as you know, uh, Theresa May's gone in three times, come back three times defeated. So the process where it's going to go from now, uh, it, I've said this time and time again, this has all been about tribal politics within West, Westminster, between the Labour Party, between uh, the Social Democrats or Liberal Democrats, the DUP and also the Conservatives. It has not been about what's in the best interest of the country in my view. And so I've been uh, sensing in terms of the meat industry for us not to get caught in too much of a bind. We need to see a circuit breaker. It came along uh, last week with Boris Johnson's. I'm not saying that this is a good or a bad thing, but we needed a circuit breaker of some kind. Uh, and if you looked at the candidates, uh, Boris was probably the one that looked the most likely to be it. Uh, so he has strongly argued for a no deal. And I'm going to talk about the percentages in a minute. So significantly uh, that if he doesn't do something uh, that gets him across this line, he's gone, in my view. It is so fundamental in terms of what he has said on the campaign. Uh, and I think the simplicity of his message has had some breakthrough and the latest message he sent to Europe, which I think is quite fascinating, unless you open the agreement, and this is the withdrawal agreement, this is the difference from the political declaration. The withdrawal agreement's the sticking point. It has about the no backstop on it. Unless you open that up, there is no point in me coming to Brussels. So he's turned it back onto the Europeans and said, you've got to work out how we're going to find a solution through this, otherwise we get to the 31st of October and it's all over, Rover. So he's, ha he's been rampant, uh, I must say, and had a good clean out in Cabinet, and I can fully understand that. I think for New Zealand, two appointments are really important. Uh, Liz Trust has come in as the Secretary of State for the Department of International Trade. I have to say, this is a personal view, so don't, it's not the meat industry. I thought Liam Fox didn't do enough under the, this role, I thought it just seemed to knock it ground on and on and on. Uh, and I think we're gonna see some changes there. And Teresa Villas uh, is the Secretary of State for the Department of Food and Environment, quite a critical poll role for us. And uh, I think we'll, just by her politics, she tends to be, these both tend to be slightly dry and on the right, uh, and both are uh, Brexiteers. Michael Gove, so I put here, he became appointed to the Duchy of Lancaster. If you want to know what that is, he's in charge of all the Queen's estates, basically. Um, and I initially saw some reporting that said this was a position of special projects. Um, this is where you park somebody that you want to keep close to you as your enemy, uh, but you don't want to throw them out to the walls. But in actual fact, he's now ahead of the Cabinet Committee for the whole exit programme. Uh, Boris has told him he has to meet seven days a week until the 31st of October. He doesn't want to hear anybody going on holiday. He needs to see this ran through and he needs to see it pretty quickly. Here are the options. These are my percentages. Uh, I have said since about November last year that I think the risk of a no uh, deal and a crash out was very high. I've always said it about 60%. And the reason I've said that is because of the tribal politics and also the reaction out of the European Union. Everybody tells me, don't worry, Jeff, on the 11th hour, they'll find a solution. I look forward to it. So on the first one, um, he goes to Brussels and he says that, um, you know, we need to open this and have an orderly transition, 22 minutes. They're going to give him the one finger. It's pretty obvious. I, don't, I can't see any movement. I can see some movement around the p political declaration it won't be enough for Boris to get it across his bricks and his. On the next one, a chance that he comes back and explains that he has an extension and he needs to go out uh, for a period of another three months or something to get there. I think the public reaction will be quite severe and so it's not a path you'll be excited about. Uh, he's blocked from crashing out. Now, this, is a interesting, this is a constitutional matter. Uh, you've got a speaker who's about, in my view, is about to retire from the parliament once Brexit's through. 
uh, who's looking for his next career. He's been quite, a, he's been very independent. I'll be interested in talking to Lockwood later in terms of uh, a speaker, but he has been quite independent, which is a good thing. But uh, it's just intriguing when he does rules for what amendments go in around Brexit. It's been intriguing. But anyway, he's going to rattle through. And on the basis of that, um, I just can't see uh, them having the ability uh, to stop something happening other than by a vote. So this whole sort of proroguing parliament, all that sort of nonsense, I think is too high a risk. Uh, so I think there's about a 50% chance and a crash out no deal on the 31st of October 6070. The only thing I'd say, if you took the combination of the first three, bits of each of those, he will then go to the public, and I think this is a high chance of this, and say, look, I have tried everything. And as much as I don't want to put you through this, we're three years away from our next election, I'm going to have to go to you to get the mandate in order to get you out of, of Brexit. Look, I, it's, it's a big risk, uh, but I think I just can't see him getting anything, a solution by the 31st, and therefore he's got to do something amongst this group of four options in order to get his way out of it. Implications for the meat industry. Uh, so the first one I just wanted to talk about is the split quota. Um, so as you'll be aware, <laughs> this is always I found fascinating. One of the first things and only things that UK and Europe 27 could agree on was to split the damn quota in terms of a Brexit deal. So we split the quota. That was the proposal uh, that applies to a whole range of quotas. And... We've objected to that. It's gone through a process uh, and is now sitting in Geneva uh, and on the basis that of the WTO. Uh, they've just gone through the consultation round in terms of uh, submissions, etc. to it. Uh, there was a bit of a view for a while. The Europeans were picking off the Caribbeans and some of the other smaller countries by saying to them, wait till you get to an FTA, you'll get a much better deal. Don't worry about this, it's not a bit. And, but fortunately, everybody's held the line I uh, met with the uh, MFAP officials last week uh, from Geneva and everybody's holding the line in terms of this. this is quite a fundamental thing for us. They say it's a technical matter. This is a material matter in New Zealand's view and uh, 11 of the major other quotas, uh, including the US, Russia, etc. We are seen as leading this debate uh, in terms of WTO uh, and that's been just, look, I just think that we've stuck to the line. MFAP have been fantastic in this. They just... Bengalis on the team just don't want to let go, and it is quite fundamental. These are, people sort of worry about these things, oh, it's not so, but this is fundamental. We have to hold the line on these things because we are a small nation, depending on 95% of our exports, and every time we let the WTA slip over a little bit, it's a big risk. And so I think it is, uh, I think of all the issues we're dealing with, and we may lose this, but of all the issues we're dealing with, this is the one that we need to keep a line on. I think that in terms of uh, Brexit, as I said, look, we're about into episode 13. God only knows what will happen. The only thing I say in terms of the impact of no deal will be brutal in terms of the meat industry. Welsh lamb sends about 35, 45% of its product goes to France. On the basis of a no deal, they crash out. The WTO rules executed and then they will have to pay a tariff. It's an ad valorem tariff, so it varies from 48 to 55%. So what happens is Welsh lamb won't go to France. Uh, and the market will get distorted for a while and there'll be extra volume going on to the market. And uh, you could imagine the Welsh farmers in the valleys, I was there for three days last week. They're not excited by the concept of it. Um, and uh, interestingly, They've been through a whole lot of scenarios about what they're going to do. The government's effectively, through Gove, as the DEFRA minister, said they'll prop it up in some way. So we've been trying to explore with them what propping up might look like, because there are significant differences in the propping up. Uh, where is the product going to go? Uh, because if it stays in cool stores, or if it's put on the market, it will have an impact on price. Uh, there is no direct solution for the propping up. Uh, we've heard everything from piles being burnt through to frozen pro pr freezing product down uh, to just putting it on the market. There is no policy decision yet made 
in terms of what that would happen there. Beef imports, this is fascinating. 330,000 tonne, Irish importers, they are the roughest, toughest bunch of people you ever meet. I was at a IMTA meeting, the importers meeting, we had Treasury there, the fellow that designed the little tariff quota system, and a person from uh, the um, HMRC, that's the uh, customs, explaining all the technicalities about what will happen with the new tariff rates if we go into WTO, it crashed out. They released the tariff rates, 20%, uh, on Irish beef coming into the UK. And the Irish, the normal presentations, and Irish farmers say, uh, Irish beef importer says, so if I take my meat and I take it up to Northern Ireland and then I ship it to England, there's no tariff. That's correct, sir, but it's illegal. Can I just repeat it? If I take it up to Northern Ireland, <laughs> take it across to England, there'll be no tariff. That's correct, sir, but it's illegal and we will chase you and find you. How will you find me if you're not at the border? And, and so there's about five, and they really just got animated about this whole thing. And this poor wee Treasury fellow had spent three years designing this, and these fellows were saying, effectively, the f as soon as I find my mates whipped a container over there to get it into England, to not pay the tariff, if you think I'm going to sit on my ass and watch them make money, you're dreaming. And the other thing they got approached to, could they store the product? And they said, where do I store it? If I store it in Ireland, and then you whack the bloody tariff on, I'm going to get done for 10 million euro. Ain't doing that for you. If I store it into the UK, I can't get storage, and you're not prepared to pay for the cost of storage. I mean, it is just a nonsense in terms of the practical thinking along behind in a lot of these decisions in terms of what they're going to do. They will, in my view, find ways to shift product around. The sort of belief that the shelves will have nothing on them, that the Spanish won't send their tomatoes up, they will find ways around it. There will be delays at Dover. Uh, there will be chaos in terms of the initial period of it, but eventually I think we'll find in terms of our industry, uh, fortunately the date, 31st of October, works really well, uh, it will be better. As I said, in terms of that, Look, everybody wants a concessionary exit agreement. That is the 22 months out the other end and away you go. Uh, that would allow for the, for the process to do that. Righto, free trade agreement, the EU 28. Because UK is still part of the European Union, it cannot negotiate a free trade agreement until it exits. Now, it sounds ludicrous, but it is quite logical. Otherwise, you'd have 27 other countries popping off and doing their own little free trade agreements, not part of it. So UK cannot physically enter into an FTA with New Zealand or the US or Australia until it gets out. Uh, so the negotiations currently taking place are the free trade agreement with 28 countries, including the UK, by the European Commission in Brussels. So then at the end, they get out. What happens to the 28 becomes 27 and then the UK then has to negotiate one with New Zealand. But we're not quite sure how the implication, nobody can give an answer. So if we get an agreement on the 28 for the quota, how do we deal with it when it goes out and then we have the 27 plus one? Nobody's quite sure about this. Um, let's work our way through the first bit and then see where we get to. So we're in that process. That is um, really interesting. It comes and goes a little bit. There's a little bit off at the moment in terms of, of those negotiations. And we do this process um, where agriculture is the last thing, right? So everything else is on the table, probably 80% of it's been progressed reasonably well. Uh, and then we'll come to agriculture. Geographical indicators are a big issue. Uh, and they've been trying to get, this is the European Union, Australia, New Zealand and the US through at about the same sort of time frame. Good news is Trump's fixed the US one. It ain't moving far. In my view, they will not allow chemical uh, washed chicken in. They will not allow hormone beef in. Pretty simple. I can't see them changing on that. The Australians, they're having a bit of trouble with mining. Uh, and they've fallen back a bit in terms of where they are. So I think New Zealand's in a reasonably good position around the FTA. Uh, your guess is as good as mine at the moment as to what we might actually get out of it. But I, I, if you want to see an indicator of what's happening, uh, I, and, and we're going to have a different system, but I'll explain that. Mercosur has done this deal for 99,000 tonne. 
China's short of beef at the end of, of protein at the end of the year, eight and a half million ton, you know, and the Irish are upset about 99,000 ton, along with the French. They have to, the deal's done. They now have to get 27 countries to sign off and then the European Parliament. The French and the Irish have already said, if it's not good for our farmers, we're not going to do it. I don't quite understand what that means, and it's a part of the rhetoric that it will disappear, it will get less and less as it gets the time. When New Zealand comes to do its FTA, we're under the different rules. We only have to have the Commission make the recommendation and the European Parliament sign it off. We don't have to go back to the 27 countries. So it is quite significant. But just watch the Mercosur. If the Mercosur one tips over, I don't think we will have much progress on the agriculture front. Uh, in terms of, uh, as I said, the geographical indicators and also uh, the other one um, you will, Australia's having trouble around is uh, animal welfare. And we're starting to see a bit of a noise in this. I've just done the consultation document for the UK one um, and there's just been that normal standard stuff that comes out saying that we're not as good as they are. Uh, they've got a couple of real problems. Halal kill in the UK uh, is only done for 75% of lambs. Everybody thought it was about 90. DEFRA did a survey, released the details in February this year. 25% of the plants don't do halal kill. So this is about pre-stun, right? So they don't stun prior to slaughter. Uh, huge welfare issue. Uh, they won't do anything about it at the moment. Useless wool as a minister, I think but they won't do it because of the Muslim population consumes 30% of the wool lamb in the UK. And so they're going to have a bit of a battle on that one. Uh, and I think they're going to have some difficulty in terms of a welfare issue. So every time they start to raise their ones, I say, so tell me about your halal kill. How are you going along with that one? Uh, they've got some real difficulties. But we, we'll see some pressure around tailing of lambs, all that sort of stuff coming through uh, uh, as we go through that process. And I think that um, in terms of uh, the UK one, we're in this process called trade dialogue. Um, if I was to be slightly cynical, it's like having morning and afternoon tea. We have nice chats, but really nothing happens. I'm just going to close with a couple of comments. These are my views, not necessarily uh, the views of the industry or anybody else. But I just find them interesting in terms of context of both speakers earlier today. So I did these on Thursday, I had nothing to do with the speakers, I didn't know who was speaking. Consumer patterns are continually changing. Uh, look, in the UK now, 38% of the food is consumed outside of the kitchen, not made in the kitchen. At Canary Wharf, for those that know London, there's a, just a new lot of apartments built, 630 apartments, they only have a microwave in them. No kitchen at all, because all the food's available in the, in the downstairs. If you go into a standard m &S metro now, Everything's pre-prepared. There's nothing you can physically buy in the metro ones really to take home and cook. It's all ready to go. Um, I, I spent a bit of time with Kentar. Now Kentar were, um, were the, probably the largest uh, surveying company in the world. They do 30,000 domestic homes every day, uh, every day uh, surveying what they do in terms of their consumer patterns uh, in the UK. 30,000. That's a lot of people. They are showing vegans are being slightly static uh, in terms of that, in terms of the numbers. So I just want to get this into context. For the UK only, there are only 0.5% of the population are vegans. It stayed pretty static. They make a bit of noise, they go up and down and they protest quite a bit. Usually funded by the taxpayer through some benefit system that they're operating on. 5% are vegetarian. So only 5%, it goes from 4 up to 6 and back to 5. But 7%, which is flexitarian, so generally classified as only two meat meals a week, that 7% sort of come from nowhere, although we've been doing it since the Stone Age, let's be real about it, but measured has gone from 0 to 7% in five years. That's where the growth is coming in terms of the change in the way they operate. 86% of consumers still walk in the shop and buy on price. We should never forget that. I mean, we can always look for the changes in the markets, but that is the truth. This is the fascinating thing. Supermarkets, I've learnt this, supermarkets are not driven by consumers at all. They are driven by NGOs 
who do these surveys and rank them on welfare or environmental standards or anything, and they panic about where they fit in those ranks. These are large, like the Bird Society, the huge uh, NGO operating in the UK, does this annual ranking, and you know, from Waitrose through to uh, ASDA, where they fit in that thing. And they all panic about where they fit. So that's what drives it. And I find it fascinating. I go in Marks and Spencer in Kensington, and all these people carry their bags out, their single plastic bags they still use, um, and they go out onto the street and head home with their bags, put everything in the freezer or in the fridge, and they've scrutinised, according to the supermarket, where the meat's come from, whether it's hormone in it, whether it's organic, where the vegetables come from and everything. Then they go down the street, back into High Street, Kensington, to the supermarket, have a meal, predominantly meat-based, never ask one question about where the broccoli came from, the parsnip came from, the meat came from, but they're happy. And so that's the difference. And our drive into the food sector, in my view, is a good drive because the scrutiny is not the same as you're going to continue to get uh, out of the supermarkets as they go forward. The biggest issue in front of us is this, and it's just what you've had before in much more detail, but these are again classic statements. Uh, and this has come from Nature's report done by Oxford University, which effectively said, if you want to save the planet, stop eating meat. And I would have to say, this is the thing I've noticed the most impact in a general conversation sitting at the Elephant Castle pub at the end of Kensington uh, with people. They actually genuinely believe they have to do something. And according to Oxford University, or the Lancet report, uh, the Nature report is that they should eat less meat because that's going to help save the environment. It's not about whether they're flexitarian vegans, veg vegans or anything else, but it has significantly changed, in my view, the argument and what they see as being the impact on the environment. If you look at the consumption, for the first time in my 35 years of farming, uh, the contract offered, I hope, by Alliance Group, if they're here, uh, for this coming season will be at a higher price, net higher price, than the Welsh and UK farmer are currently getting. It's never happened in my 35 years. When it was four pound in the UK, it's usually four dollars a kilo here. It is going just under four pound, the consumption in meat has dropped by about 20% in both continental Europe and in the UK over the last uh, two to three months. Now, a lot of it's to do with the heat at 40 degrees. They just don't get so excited. But there is something underlying from all the commentators' view about what is actually happening in terms of around the trends of, of red meat. This is a mature market. It's not going to have a lot of growth in it. We should be thankful for North Asia. Uh, I think it's going to have some sticky times uh, going forward and it is important for us as an industry to collectively say we need to do something about uh, the view and the thinking around the consumers in regard to where the meat is not. If you haven't learnt about uh, GWP star and the impact of methane out of the other side of Oxford University, the Martin School, uh, this is Professor uh, uh, Miles and the work that they've done, which shows that the gas calculation done from the Kyoto Agreements and... Well, I was going to say a crock of shit, but I shouldn't, but it, it, I mean, it's wrong, right? Gas, methane shoots up, comes back down. It only has an impact for 12 years. We are actually in a neutral state, and the, the sooner we get that message out, the better. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Happy to answer questions. Thanks very much, Jeff. Right, we've got time for some questions. Is everyone in stunned horror at the impending slow train crash that is Brexit? Question over here. Um, hi, Nicola Dennis from AgriHQ. Um, you talked about the split between the UK and the EU quota, and I was just wondering for some clarification there, were you talking about a greater proportion of the EU? No, the, um, so what they did is work out a three-year average uh, of historical uh, use of the quota. Oh, I so, mean what you, were, what, you, what, what you were hoping would happen. Oh, not split at all. 
not split it at all, uh, and on the basis of that we've got the ability to operate the 228,000 tonne in any of the 28 countries, basically. Yeah. Which bit did I get wrong, Brockwood? Oh, Jeff, uh, <laughs> thanks very much. No, 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 not very much. Thanks very much. I mean, it is fascinating times, and thanks for your talk. Are you aware, about 10 days ago in the UK, a 300-page document on the alternative to the Irish backstop was launched yeah. that uh, utilised information from how Australia and New Zealand handle the border under CER, how TTMRA, the our Mutual Recognition <laughs> Agreement with Australia, handles regulation, how the Canadian-North American border operates. Uh, there's, and, of course, Boris's team, we've made sure Boris's team is right across that. And there's some interest in Europe in looking, and they've already Europe's had a bit of a look at that, including some of Barnier's team. Has it, has it got any? Uh, is there any awareness of that in in the UK at all, or has that remained largely below the below the, the sort of the the horizon? Because it was publicly released about ten days ago, and. Uh, and I guess I'm involved in a bit through the yeah. Institute of Economic Affairs. And uh, it really does provide a, a genuine option, not just for getting rid of the Irish backstop or replacing it, but actually the whole future relationship between the, uh, the UK and the EU in, in border management. Well, it's getting, it's, it, it is Lockwood. I got a copy from one of the New Zealand government departments out of London, without naming anybody. Um, so it is circulating around. And I thought, look, there, there's been, as you'll know, there's been this huge debate about how do you operate the border without a border. Uh, and I think that, um, from what I understand, I haven't read the report, but the, you know, there are some really logical outcomes there. I think the problem, you get this debate about, it might take three years, it might take five years in terms of technology. I think there are some aspects that they could do now that would do it. And look, you're talking about 10% of the trades you need to track. 90% of it doesn't matter. They don't track our trade, you know, when it comes through the port now. So, you know, it's not that hard. Any other questions for Jeff? No, no more questions? Okay, well, it just remains for me to say thank you, Jeff. And we have some gifts. I'd like to thank the Alliance, Ansco, and Silver Fern Farms for sponsoring our gifts today. And thank you very much, Jeffrey, for sharing Thanks. those insights. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. you.